Hi, uh, morning everybody. I'm Lucy and this is Liz. We are from uh, Lucy Chang Fine Art and uh, today we're going to talk about street art. And uh, of course, uh, if we talk about um, street art or even contemporary art, people will think Murakami is one of the iconic um, artists in our times. So today we'll talk about Murakami and uh, his uh, four disciples. So that's um, Masaki, Tango One, and Snipe One, and Diego. So it's our first time doing live, uh, so we're a bit nervous. And because of the situation, so hope it's not too boring for you. And um, we're not academics, so we try to do some research, but if there's something missing or any mistakes, please, please let us know. And um, so here you can see, you have a pointer. Oh, there's uh, Masaki and uh, Diego and uh, Tango One there with a smiley face covering their face because they're, they're graffiti writers, so they don't want to show their face. Yep. And uh, Liz is going to give a little background about uh, Murakami first. Um, thank you, Lucy. Um, as we all know, Murakami is one of the most popular artists in the contemporary art scene nowadays. And um, one of the reasons why he success in doing so is because uh, he breaks the rules in the art world and creates his own one. And he is successful in uh, breaking the boundaries between high art and low art. And um, let us uh, let me give you a little bit background of Murakami. And he was born in Tokyo in 1962, and he attended um, Tokyo National University of Fine Arts to study um, Nihonga style of painting at that time. And then um, later in um, later years, he received opportunity to participate in international studio program in New York. So he moved to New York and um, lived for a couple of years. And here's the very first um, paintings of Murakami in Nihonga style. And then um, he started to create some pure contemporary art pieces. Um, uh, because he was not uh, really so successful in doing so, so he wondered, is there any way that he can um, create his own form of art instead of following the traditional way? Um, so super flat is the theory uh, he, he created to combine the high arts and the low arts. Um, here's one of the examples he created of the iconic character, Mr. Dob, and insert the character into the Nihonga style paintings. And let us see how he talks about the super flat theory. That is completely flatness composition. A uh, lot of chickens, a lot of dogs. The painter is organizing for the eyeball moving. For example, who is the highest level in Japanese culture scene is a comic writer is the highest. Yeah, so he continues to create art pieces based in super flat style. And here's some example of uh, his works in the early... Oh, that's Kai Kai and uh, Kiki. Yeah. <laughs> That's the two iconic characters. And then his words becomes more complicated in um, um, forms and the context. And um, in late 2000s, there's a breakthrough that LV approaches um, Murakami to start uh, collaborations and they create some art pieces. And at that time, Murakami becomes a superstar and um, followed by a couple of exhibitions and um, shows across the world. And you can see his words uh, continues to evolve in times. And here's uh, one of the 
a big um, exhibition that I would like to share with you is the one in Tycoon Contemporary last year in Hong Kong. It is the most important one in his career life. I so I hope all of you has been <laughs> have seen it already. Yeah, it's really a great hit. And um, uh, his style and his um, unique way of creating art attracted many celebrities and brand collaborations. Oh yeah, here's me. Uh, actually, I met him the first time in 2016 at a dinner. He was sitting next to me and uh, he was so into social media. So we took a selfie and immediately he, he posted on his Instagram. And later on, I met him a few times at uh, different fairs. And also, I visited uh, Kakakiki in Tokyo. And uh, he, he set up the, the, the gallery to promote international artists. So Wendy, Wendy White was one of the artists that he created the show. And then uh, so I was lucky to be there. And uh, of course, I didn't miss the big show in Tycoon. Uh, we would like to talk about street art and how they meet. Uh, here is how they first met back in 2007. And uh, the image shows a billboard for Murakami show in Mocha Museum in LA. And then there were two artists, two graffiti artists without permission, put their graffiti on this billboard. And um, the reaction from Wakami was like, um, this is really quite interesting. So he started to include um, graffiti elements in his words eight years later because he really f uh, thought that graffiti is full of playfulness and full of fun that deserve as much attention as those high arts. And, uh, by bringing the graffiti into his artworks. It is actually in line with the super flat theory he creates that to, to, to break, to burn the lines between high culture and low culture. So um, later on, he even include the graffiti works in his museum shows. For example, the one in Garage Museum of Contemporary Art Moscow in 2017 and the one in a Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, you can see the graffiti elements are in the artworks in the background and also on the sculpture here. Yeah, so and uh, he, he made in his museum shows, he actually brought all the disciples with him like Masaki and Snipe One. Um, so you may wonder what actually is street art or street culture. Um, street culture in general is popular styles of urban centers. So nowadays it mainly refers to skateboarding, hip hop, graffiti, street fashion and hipsters. While street art is visual art created in public locations for public visibilities and, and in it includes graffiti and installation and sculptures. Question. So we, well, because it's a live stream, we were supposed to have an audience before, so we gathered some questions. Uh, so one of the question was, um, any difference between graffiti and street art? Actually, we cannot say there's difference because graffiti is part of street art in the bigger picture. So street art could be performance arts, could be uh, music and graffiti is just part of it. And uh, I would like to introduce you a little bit of graffiti. So graffiti could be writing or drawing made on public space. And uh, so there's some few styles like tagging. Tagging is using like uh, marker pens or just very, very bold letters. They normally just put their name. And uh, throw up is another style that is um, together, similar with tagging, but with more color. And posters, standstills, and stickers are just very quick ways of doing um, uh, graffiti art. Uh, as graffiti is prohibited in most countries, so the artists, they just really need to work fast. So standstills, like stickers and posters, just really quick way of uh, 
putting their art around town. And uh, a lot of the artists, they work at night. So, um, so mainly the, the medium is mainly spray paint and uh, marker pen is commonly used. And uh, the graffiti culture is quite an interesting culture. So this is the show we did for um, one toe and neck face. Uh, one toe is Japanese graffiti artist, and uh, neck face is from America. So this is my first street art um, exhibition in my gallery uh, in 2018. So we had the artist painted our outside wall, and um, it's really funny. They the community, the graffiti community, they really respect each other. So when I invited the next artist to paint on my walls, they say, oh, Lucy, I think you should uh, make an announcement first before you washed it off. So I actually made an announcement on Instagram saying that we have last week of showing um, one toe and neck face. And after I washed that, then the next graffiti artist was happy to paint on my walls. So they kind of really respect each other. Yeah, so this is another question that we got earlier is um, how can an artist get final credit for his works? Um, it's, of course, early on was very difficult. And uh, here we'd like to show a lawsuit that the artist actually won. This is a milestone for all the graffiti artists. Um, in 2018, um, these group of artists, like uh, Five Points, they're their um, their works were washed off by the developer, and um, but under the um, under the Visual Artist Rights Act, um, they were they actually won the case. So um, so the property had to pay these artists, yeah, a lot of money. So this is a milestone for all the graffiti artists. Yeah. And of course, um, now slowly they're getting more credits. For example, like Bensi and uh, even Basquiat, he was uh, a graffiti artist at the beginning. And uh, now we focus on the young artists, um, the disciples. So we talk about Masaki, Diego, Tango One, and Snipe One. So these four artists has been with uh, Murakami for uh, recent years. And um, Murakami has been pushing them and bringing them to his various shows. Uh, of course, we'd like to just quickly introduce Kai Kai Kiki Gallery. So it was founded by Murakami to actually work on his projects and all his um, uh, merchandise and collaborations. And uh, also he creates uh, exhibitions in the space. And Zingaro is uh, set up recently, more in more recent years. It's a space on um, outskirts of Tokyo, and there he will show more experimental young artists. And, um, and also it's a cafe, so you could have uh, sunflower burgers there. Oh, here's Masaki. You can see he's uh, quite a big guy, and uh, we have a clip about him. Whew. This thing gets nasty in summertime. When I grew up in the States, every summer my dad um, brought us to different countries. So every, every country we go, we had to go to the museum. So I grew up looking at all those famous paintings around the world. Every time I see the painting, I always wanted to like draw something on the, the real painting. It's, it's perfect, you know? And perfect thing to me is so boring. It doesn't look like, does it look like Kanye? It does. <laughs> so yeah, this is him. And people might wonder what is, what does Masaki mean? Actually, it's quite simple. It's mad sake. He, he really enjoys drinking sake. And uh, so um, he was born in, in Japan, but he grew up in New Jersey. And he graduated from the Parsons School of Design in New York. And uh, actually, so, so his experience of uh, two cultures, which formed his personality and uh, artistic style. So his interests um, mainly centers on art history and the critiquing 
mass culture with reference to slang, movies, and manga characters. But recently, he's been exploring more uh, personal and intimate um, topics. So um, he developed a signature style using spray paint as a fine art medium. Um, he's very, um, you can see these pictures. He's uh, parodying all the masterpieces. And uh, also last year when he had his solo in Hong Kong, he, um, he, he, he painted the, the poster of the Kung Fu Hustle movie. So it's, he's really, he used his uh, laughter and humor as both as um, distraction and therapy for his internal turmoil. Because when he grew up in the States, he experienced actually a lot of racism and, um, and uh, bullying. So this, um, you can see, he, he's a very big guy, but he always laugh and, and talk loud or quite funny. But it's kind of like a cover up to, to hide his inner, um, inner pain, I would say, yeah. Um, so these are some of his collaborations uh, with Murakami. So, and uh, he went to different shows with him. And here's one of the work that he used his uh, typical spray can style with uh, Murakami's uh, smiley face and skull. And this is one of his early, well, uh, first show in Zingaro Gallery. And this one was in Kakakiki Gallery. So Murakami actually pushed him quite hard. Imagine an artist having a solo every year. It's quite a lot of work. And he worked as a designer very early age. I mean, early days, in, even in 2006, he was collaborating with uh, Clot. He was designing uh, clothes for the Clot fashion brand. And uh, me, I, I first saw his work in 2016 um, in Japan. And uh, he's, I saw his Wannabe series, which is now the most popular uh, series among the collectors. And later on, I, of course, saw him in different uh, exhibitions. And I went to his uh, solo exhibition in Bangkok in 2018, where he painted his iconic smiley face on my shoulder. There. So the next artist we would like to talk about is Tango One. Uh, we wonder what does Tango One mean? So actually, it means art is my calling. So Tango Wan um, grew up in the near the um, U.S. Army base in Japan, so he ha he was very much influenced by the American culture, and he started um, graffiti at the age of fourteen, and he was very active in the nineties, and his style is very versatile. So he had um, uh, this this monster on the left side of the screen uh, is his very iconic. Um, image that he always use. And this, this monster actually portrays the, the absurdity of modern society, such as wars, uh, national disasters, and uh, political and um, economic failures. But he also used this to represent himself and as well as the audience. So we will see um, his breakthrough actually came through this set of works, which, would, which look like cardboard but actually they're not. They are actually sculptures. They are wooden sculptures that to make to look like cardboard. And all the details, um, here we have one, you can, let's see the details of this work. It's three dimensional. So every details, even the, the coffee drain on the, on the table, the tape, he painted it. All this, he painted them. So he was um, a sculpture to look like a cardboard. Yeah. And also you will notice uh, a lot of his uh, characters, they're Disney characters, because he, he actually worked with uh, um, Disney uh, animation. And uh, also you would notice a lot of the works of the face are distorted because he says that this represents the graffiti artists because graffiti artists never show their full face. And so we have showed, showed him um, in our booth in 2018, and uh, he was very, very popular, I must say. 
And the next artist uh, we're introducing is Snipe One. And uh, if you follow his Instagram, it's um, called um, Fuck It All Tokyo. You could imagine what that means. Um, so he was a pioneer uh, Japanese graffiti writer. He was very active, uh, first in Japan. And then he went to live in New York in his teenage years. So there he, he even uh, embraced more of the graffiti. So he's very pop, um, known in the international graffiti world, the, society, the, the community. And uh, well, he's, um, graf uh, Snipes graffiti draws upon the, draws upon the uh, sensibility of street culture, but incorporates the edge of dirtiness that's kind of um, his styles. And recent years, he's been collaborating with um, a lot of uh, fashion brands as well. And uh, we can see him. Oh, this is the show he did at Zingaro Tokyo. Very colorful and spray paint, a lot of characters. So this is one of his projects in the um, Ishihara Lakeside Museum in Japan. That's one of his projects in Germany. And uh, this is the most recent show in LA where he put his um, graffiti works onto canvas. And uh, we are also showing him in our upcoming sh exhibition. So the next artist is uh, Diego. Actually, this do look like him. Uh, Diego was born in Japan and he, he never went to any art school. Um, he's always on the street. If you follow his Instagram, his stories, he's always everywhere on the street on his bike. So his works also portrays the street. You can see um, rat, um, spray cans, buildings, pipes, or even garbage. So he kind of uh, brings this, um, this, brings this street into his work, yeah, and um, it's kind. Of, he rearranged these um, visual elements in manga abstract style, so it's kind of a modern graffiti style that combines abstract painting with uh, distorted cartoon characters. And uh, uh, Diego is introduced like a strange but a very familiar cityscape to the viewers. Oh, this is his show in Zingaro. And uh, Diego also have uh, worked and followed Murakami a lot. So you could see on the left screen is a Murakami exhibition in Tycoon. And there have, uh, Diego painted the, the wall. And he also painted uh, many of the Art Basel fair, um, the, the backdrop. He and a few artists, they painted. So uh, we have shown him since 2019, and he's been very well received in Hong Kong, also in Taiwan. We've shown him twice in Taiwan. Okay. Um, here is Beyond the Street 2019, and it is one of the, uh, actually it is the most uh, important festival in street arts. Um, um, last year, Muraka Murakami actually brought um, his uh, disciples, including Masaki, Tango One, and also Snipe One together into this festival, and they created huge pieces of artworks, uh, like the, this one um, um, with many paintings and the sculpture here. So one of the questions that came earlier was, can street art be presented in galleries and museums? Yes, of course. Uh, as you've seen in the different museum shows with Murakami, um, the graph and also the group show in in in, in America, the all the street art and graffiti are actually going to the museum. And uh, here also we did. Hey, how many play? Hmm? Yeah, this is what we showed in our space. Another uh, Japanese graffiti artist. So, and inside um, the gallery, we had uh, pieces on canvas. Yeah, 
so the other question came in earlier was how we can better engage a public with street art. So what we did is uh, when our artists paint um, on our walls, we put on live stream so that everybody could, could see it and follow. And uh, we also work with a lot of uh, brands. So um, one way of uh, working with um, street art and uh, graffiti artists is uh, I, I hope everybody, who, when you see some art on the street, do take picture, um, do post on, on social media, and do tag them. Then so more people would know it. I guess you may like to take a taste of our street arts in galleries, so here's the chance. Um, we would like to announce our upcoming shows uh, next week in our gallery. It is of uh, the Art Central Offline Show. And um, so we will be exhibiting works from um, mainly five of our artists. They are Diego from Tokyo, Snipe One from Tokyo, You Know Me Well from Berlin, Awutasu from Tokyo too, and Eddie Kang from Seoul. Uh, although their styles are different, but um, all of them um, paints to uh, address different issues in the society. Okay, so uh, this was another question that came in earlier, was uh, where do we see Hong Kong street art in the next five years? Actually, Hong Kong street art is very vibrant. Um, we have organizations like uh, Hong Kong Walls that uh, organize artists to paint on different walls uh, legally. Uh, and uh, there's uh, you could experience a lot of street arts everywhere. Like I said earlier, um, we should post them on social medias and we should always tag them. And uh, I think uh, there's going to be growing numbers of street art appreciation in, in well, not next five years, even in the next two years. So uh, thank you all very much. And uh, if you want to know more, you can follow us on our social media to get the updates. And you can also see our uh, our Central online show here. And um, if you would like to attend our upcoming show, you can register in the link here. And um, thank you very much for um, uh, seeing our live stream talk today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today um, from the comforts of your home. Uh, I'm here with Andrew Luck. Um, well, first I'll introduce myself and give an introduction to the talk, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of just dive in. Um, my name is Willem Molesworth. I'm the director of this art gallery. Um, I'm also the, or one of the vice presidents of the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association, um, and I have my own side project called Suitcase Institute uh, that I do with my wife. Um, this is Andrew Luck. Uh, he's an artist who is represented by Desart. Um, he is uh, based here in Hong Kong. Um, he was the first artist we had engage in our uh, residency program, um, where we kind of give our gallery to a Hong Kong-based artist for two months in the summer. Um, he's uh, since then, which happened about three years ago, he's, he's done very, very well. Um, his artwork belongs to several uh, very important public collections and private collections across the world. Um, most recently, uh, his large-scale installation, Haunted Salvaged, was supposed to be displayed in uh, Art Basel's um, Encountered section. Uh, but since that was canceled, uh, we have taken it and will be showing it in the gallery in an exhibition that opens April 4th. Oh, I'm sorry, April 11th. April 11th. Um, uh, he also has artwork uh, being exhibited here in Asia Society, um, and that show, I think, opens in May. Um, it's called Next Act, and it's all about Hong Kong contemporary art, um, which, is, which is really interesting. Um, so uh, the, the title of our conversation today is Futuristic Past Present. Um, I'll read the blurb, and then I'll start asking Andrew some questions. We all live in the past. The fraction of a second it takes for our minds to process the world around us is a guarantee that we always lag behind in the current moment. Nonetheless, the world at large spirals uncontrollably forward. 
Fictional elements of sci-fi novels that once seemed far away are now ever-present reminders of our current era, one that is stuck between the near past, the unattainable present, and the far-off future. Andrew Luck's practice, strongly rooted in Hong Kong and the city's unique place within the world politic, engages these ideas and more. Uh, I will discuss these concepts with Andrew on the eve of his participation in Asia Society's exhibition Next Act and to start's exhibition Shifting Landscapes. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Um, your work has a very strong connection to place. Um, your Chronicle Compression series, which I have on the screen right now, uh, is uh, uh, in which you, this series, you take aluminum and you uh, rub it on surfaces. Um, and it cannot be made unless there are surfaces within a specific context and a specific location that are infused with some sort of history. Um, why? Wh why is this? Um, hello? Yeah. Well, the simple answer is that like the, the space itself or the surface itself has to... Um, it, it needs to titillate in a way, in a, in a very specific way that, that is interesting. Um, the historical context of it, however, uh, comes from the idea of the notion that history is ongoing and it's forever and it, it sort of runs through us. It runs through the things that we interact with. It's a story of us in a sense. It's, uh, and, and what we experience as the here and now is sort of the accumulation of history at that moment. Um, but the, the, the use of aluminum, of like very thin aluminum, and the process of making a rubbing by hand, it's sort of like creating, it's like archiving a surface, and um, in a way it's, it's a facsimile, it's an abstraction, however it's a very accurate uh, rendition of that surface. Um, there's really no um, choosing or picking of like how to there's only one way, in essence, to, to, to really uh, uh, manage the surface, and that's just to get the rubbing as perfectly as possible. Um, but it's the tediousness and the difficulty of like doing this for hours that gives it a kind of, um, I guess it, it, it becomes very familiar in a sense. And then recreating that with like uh, the fiberglass on the back and sort of building it building it in a way that it remains just surface and it sort of speaks to, for me at least, it speaks to about our understanding of history that, that um, while we do experience history in our daily lives, we sort of, um, in essence, you're saying the here and the now. However, it's all compact within that and it condenses into the present day. Um, and the idea, I guess, the, the, as a metaphor, or like a symbol of that, it's the, the compression of the aluminum molecules against the surface. Um, you know, the surfaces are also very unique. I, I have to pick ones that are specifically like not too brittle or, or not too soft. They have to be usually stone or brick. And the great thing about that is that, um, you know, the, the materials of the 20th century were said to be like steel, brick, uh, and glass. So it's sort of, there's this weird press present thing that I really enjoy. And the compression of it, it's, it's just, um, it's for, for me at least, there's, there's something that's said about, like it's not, it's beyond just archiving a, a surface that might be neglected, it's, it's uh, runs a little bit deeper than that. Yeah, it, I mean, I think from my perspective, it seems to be a metaphor, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the way you've just described compressing um, is is not only true for the material itself, but um, within the artwork, there are compressions of various histories within it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the one the one I have here is the one you did um, for the University of Chicago Hong Kong Center um, here at uh, this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, at uh, their center at. Uh, what, what is it? Mount Davis? Yes. Um, which is out, out by Pok Fulam, and which used to be a, which has an incredibly rich history. Um, used to be a prison, uh, it was a, a royal prison. barracks. It was a royal engineer's barracks. It was a prison, and then before that, it was a uh, battery. And at one point, a migrant, kind of like center, right? Yeah, migrant center. For refugees or yeah. something like that. And the Japanese also lived there for a little while. Yeah. yeah. So a place with a lot of really rich kind of history. And, and within the artwork itself, there were multiple textures that you've compressed within one artwork mm -hmm. that exist 
coincide, that they coincide among with one another, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that illustrates your idea further, right? E- even within this, for example, there's there's reference to the the royal engineers. There's an R and E. There's a reference to a kind of a gun case as well, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, I, it's it's incredibly kind of rich. I think. Thank you. Um, I guess let's move on to, to, the, to the next kind of body of work. Um, a, a hugely, or, or just another aspect of your work, um, a hugely dynamic um, aspect of your creativity is materiality. Um, and in next act, you'll be unveiling a series of four sculptures, um, all of which reference boundary stones uh, that had formerly been scattered across Asia society's grounds and are now on display within the facility. Um, can we talk about why you used different materials uh, and how they convey different meanings within within these artworks? Uh, yeah. Well, firstly, um, yeah, the use of the use of the boundary stones and the making of the boundary stones. It's sort of uh, I wanted to approach this series of work in a slightly different way that I've done in the past, and um, I was really interested in Asia society as a site and its history as a uh, as a barracks and in the magazine explos- the, ex- the explosives magazine um, where they manufactured and stored um, explosives and am- ammunition as well as like the you know the history of that and the connotations the social historical connotations related to that um, so the boundary stones are granite stones used to mark off the edges of uh, the land here, and they have insignias that are from the Royal Navy, to because Admiralty was essentially owned by the or uh, annexed by the the Admiralty, um, and so the, the the fun thing though is that the original boundary stones are made from like uh, granite, and it's likely that it came from near Mount Butler, that area. Um, so it's you kind of have a local history there and. This, the geology is also there. Um, but the boundary stones themselves, I'm recreating them using four different materials. Um, the first one being uh, charcoal. And charcoal is a byproduct of, of uh, uh, gunpowder manufacturing. And that's uh, suspended with uh, resin, so it's like, it's not really, it's, it's more like a condensation of particles. Um, the second one, that I'm doing is a uh, made of salt licks. So uh, salt licks are essentially uh, blocks of salt used to uh, feed uh, like bovine and, and, and rumens, so like cows and sheep. And it's supposed to supplement the, the, the nutritional, the, the nutrition that they may not get from normal feed. Um, but in this, but like, uh, you know, Asia society on the on a green hillside, like despite being somewhat in the middle of the city, is uh, has sort of uh, the area has a link to a country park, and there are animals that come through here. I've seen like wild pigs. I've heard stories about uh, civets and um, is this still working? Yeah, okay. Civets and and porcupines. So the idea being that uh, the animals that come through the area on their way to uh, other places might stop by and like help sculpt this boundary stone and wear away at it and alter its form. Uh, the next one I decided to make out of copper and copper is a, uh, well on one hand it's also um, made with, it's the material that was used to make shell casings but also it's, uh, it's a noble metal so it has sanitation qualities like uh, hospitals and uh, restaurants back in the day used to uh, have copper on their door panels, so when you were to use your hand to open it, it would, in a sense, like, uh, kill some of the bacteria. Um, and the sanitation aspect of it is very much related to uh, colonialism in general and, and how uh, like health and sanitation was used as a means to development and, uh, and uh, a lot of essentially colonial policies at the time, um, and, on, and on the one hand, it's it's like housing developments to clear hillsides of uh, uh, slums, and then you know the very generous side. And the other, on the other side, it's the weaponization of commerce and religion, and 
and a belief system to to help civilize the native and sanitation is, is in a sense used in both ways and copper is in a sense on both sides of that and and then there's one other oh right there's a uh, one other one that's made from ice yeah, yeah. um and i i think that series in and of itself is actually a really wonderful kind of summary of of the various ideas within your practice um the charcoal kind of referencing violence um not necessarily in in a a, a bloody or conflict kind of way but the violence of of um natural materials something that that fire kind of ravages um uh, the salt licks also referencing nature itself, I think is really interesting. Um, and the copper referencing human history, narratives of colonialization, um, development, sterilization, uh, really fascinating. And then, and then ice also capturing this kind of ephemerality. Um, it's, I, I think it's a really, a really cool series. Can't wait for, to, to see it on display here. Um, I guess let's move on and, and, and talk about your, your next exhibition, um, Shifting Landscape at Dessart. Um, in that exhibition, you'll be unveiling a large-scale installation um, that you have personally described to me as an anthropogenic near-future deathscape. Um, in a more official capacity, I would describe it as a kinetic cityscape that comprises that is comprised of dystopian, post-apocalyptic, rotting, man-made materials. Um, the work is very clearly engaging a discourse about the future, um, and that's due in large part to how it looks and functions. Um, why? Um, so with, in regards to like my practice, there's, there's sort of, um, I would say the Asia Society show is sort of on one hand history up until now in a way. Um, but it stops short of like trying to make uh, any prophetic sort of uh, visions of the future. Um, and then I would say the this art show is uh, maybe tries to attempt at that. Um, but of course, like the thing with the attempting the near future is that inevitably there's you have to have some uh, distance and you have to allow yourself some. Uh, some give. I mean, th this this is kind of where I think abstraction is able to step in and and sort of, uh, you know, it it's not just a strictly research based uh, work. It's more of uh, the idea of the the idea of the ephemeral, the idea of things sort of uh, hanging in the air, and like a lot of it's suspended and it's just bounces and counterbalances. It's these uh, giant mobiles that take up the gallery space and it's, um, it's sort of trying to capture the feeling or, or have an emotional reaction to those things. Um, why I would say, I would say like it's, it's strictly, I mean, it's, it's more about, it's more about what is perceivable in the near future given cir current circumstances. I mean, on one hand we're living in a tumultuous time and you know, where does it, go or what does it mean for a, a, the the cityscape or the landscape itself like w the how, how do you make an emotional how do you get an emotional response from from like something as as uh uh like i would say uh um essential as a landscape in art um so it's it's trying to push those buttons given given the current situation so exactly yeah. fascinating um <laughs> i mean i mean it, I, th I think it's really interesting um and and especially given the current time right where where i think the metaphorical landscape around us is at, is shifting it's changing right um and and this kinetic kind of installation in all of its kind of strange materiality and and otherworldly type textures approaches this kind of uncertainty that I think we're all feeling and, and that's what's really speaking to now. Um, and, and referencing landscape, that, that brings us perfectly into our, uh, our, our, our next um, conversation topic uh, and that is your Horizon Scan series. Um, here, I wonder if I can do this one. Um, is that going to work? It's supposed to be a GIF. Okay, cool. Um, another Often reoccurring theme within your work is landscape, as you just mentioned. Um, for example, one of your most well-known 
bodies of works is the Horizon Scan series, uh, where you torch and char canvas with homemade napalm. Um, after adding LEDs and submerging the results in resin, the works look kind of like aerial landscapes. Um, when I look at them, I see the surface of far off planets, something like Venus, Mars, or maybe even the moon. Um, while others see more earthbound geological features like coral reefs. Um, when addressing the landscape within this format um, and through these materials, uh, what are you hoping to contribute or add to the already vast field of portraying landscapes within art history? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's heavy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, so the... The process of making them, it it's sort of relies on heat and pressure, which is essentially how geological landscapes are formed. Um, and it's important that they're not representative of any one place or, or any specific landscapes because, again, it's that sort of the, the wiggle room that abstraction allows you of, of creating something out of nothing and then being okay with it. Um, for me, it's much more about the material and the process and creating the landscape, but not one, because it doesn't reference anything. It could be anything. It's not just necessarily earthbound. It's not necessarily uh, space. It's not necessarily like deep sea ocean. Uh, people have said coral as well. Um, but the uh, LEDs sort of are meant to uh, uh, reference time and the passing of celestial time. I mean, uh, uh, cosmic time, sorry. Um, what I hope to add to the discourse on landscape, I would, I would say, um, you know, it, I would say if you, if you look at it from the lens of like the space, the idea of space, it's sort of seen as the final frontier. Um, landscape traditionally has been uh, one of conquest or, or ownership, you know, um, uh, or, or one of taming nature, and in this in this way, like at least with the with the substance, like I I set it on fire and I have to leave it because it's just too hot to work with. Um, it sort of does its own thing. And maybe I come back later and I tear it up and collage it, but uh, the process of it requires like uh, a decision made and then just allowing it to create itself in a way. Um, and you know, it, it sort of runs up against the taming of nature. Uh, in terms of the conquest, it's need, nor is it a conquest for me. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it doesn't have that quality at least. Um, but what I, I do, however, really enjoy the, uh, the idea of it being like a satellite photo. It's from above, it's, it relates to how we understand landscape in the 21st century. Uh, either from the screen of your phone or the screen of a computer, you're always looking at it from above, and your entire spatial sort of relationship with it is altered in that sense. I mean, traditionally, a landscape has uh, a horizon line. You can see where the artist or the the, or the artist is uh, painting or, or drawing or, or photographing, photographing from. You have a sense of like that person's place in time, the f their feet on the ground or their butt in a chair. But you you lose that with the uh, with the aerial photography or satellite imaging, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's how we navigate the world these days, right? As we as we drive around in cars or navigate through cities, we're kind of on our phones, looking at an aerial perspective of mm -hmm. the world around us, which is is kind of a uniquely twenty um, first century phenomenon. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, oh, I guess I guess one other thing. Mm. I'd like to touch on within this series. Um, oh, okay. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 I'd like to invite everyone to our opening at uh, Desart on April 11th. Um, we will probably be implementing some sort of uh, social distancing measures, um, uh, but 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 I hope to see everybody there. Um, and uh, yeah, is there is there anything else you want to say, Andrew? Um, no, not specifically. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, then I think I think uh, I think that's it, um, and and we'll call it here. Uh, thanks everyone for for joining us um, online, and uh, we'll let we'll let the next folks uh, set up. Right, thanks. Great. Thank you. Hi, 
I'm Katie D. Tilly, Director of 10 Chancery Lane Gallery, and welcome to the live stream talk on the sculptor Wong Ka Ping. I met Wong Ka Ping in 1997 here in Hong Kong when he was doing a residency at the University of Science and Technology. His exhibition immediately drew my husband and I in, and we went to visit him often in France, starting our collection of his works. When I opened my gallery, Four years later, in 2001, I invited Wong Ka Ping to be my inaugural show. It is now 23 years that our friendship has grown, and I have watched his work year by year and fell in love with it more and more. Here I am in 1999 in Wong Ka Ping's studio. Wong Ka Ping was born in 1949 the year of the founding of the People's Republic of China. He came from an intellectual and creative family. His father was a famous writer who wrote the book Fu Di, translated as Frontline, and was a senior communist cad. His mother was a well-known actress. In 1994, she played Gong Li's mother-in-law in Zhang Yimou's film To Live, Huo Zhe. He recalls a happy childhood until the Cultural Revolution, where he was sent together with millions of youth to the fields to work under horrid conditions. Because his mother was connected with the theater, she was able to get him a, a position as an actor in the Red Army Theater Troupe, where he learned acting. This time in his life, his sense of humor and mis mischievous nature was already apparent. He recounts how he would make faces during the propaganda plays, making the audience laugh while the director would become infuriated. He later was transferred to work in a factory. He was allowed to read and became fascinated by the Russian authors and their storytelling. In the factory, Wong Ka Ping was especially fond of listening to the workers telling dirty jokes. He was, it was only then that he started to understand what relationships between men and women were like, and that not only men enjoyed sex, women did too. Deep se sexual frustration was felt by the whole of his generation. As he had been indoctrinated that everything to do with personal pleasure, including male and female relationships, was counter-communist, the workers' openness and their natural way of speaking gave him a new sense of freedom. After the Cultural Revolution, his mother again jumped to his rescue, this time finding him a post with the Chinese China Central Television in Beijing, CCTV. Although Wang Keping was tired of being an actor, he was happy to finally return to Beijing and obtain the highly sought after residency permit. When a few months later, Char Chairman Mao died in late 1976 and the Gang of Four were arrested and disgraced, the younger generation's political passions were stimulated. Wang Keping was among them. The, the Democracy Wall, established in December 1978, became a political center for the Beijing people, a long brick wall on Chang'an Street in the Xidan district of Beijing. The Democracy Wall became the focus for democratic dissent and was the only place in which the public was allowed to gather to put up posters expressing their political frustrations and to distribute mimeographed underground publication. This period was called the Beijing Spring, and it was a brief period of liberalization in China. During the Beijing Spring, the general public became more courageous about expressing themselves. It was a far cry from the years of torment and suffering of Wang's youth. At CCTV, Wang Keping became a scriptwriter. Whatever he wrote of any interest to himself failed to, to win approval. Communist cultural critics were always those who understood the least about art, says Wang. In their hands, he was required to make endless amendments. Because there were no photocopiers, each amendment had to be rewritten by hand, hundreds of pages at a time. One more revision to make it refined, they would say. 
Finally, Wong realized that these CAD didn't really read any of his revisions and were simply fulfilling the protocol required within the hierarchy. To shrug off the endless tedium of rewriting, he, he stopped revising the scripts and instead he would change the color of the cover from green to blue, from blue to yellow. Each time he submitted his script, the censor in chief would call him and tell him, it's much improved now, better than the last version. Try to digest the comment of the leaders and the masses. Make one more revision and it will be perfect. Wong Keping's worst suspicions were confirmed. Foreigners, as well as people from Hong Kong and Taiwan, came to mainland China, bringing with them cassette players and Western music. They would gather in open squares to dance. And, and before long, notices were erected forbidding dancing in public places. The police received continual complaints and broke up the gather gatherings. The youngsters secretly began to throw parties at home and the cassette player became a much loved and precious luxury. When Wong saw that Bai Jing Zhou was trading paintings for cassettes of music, he was very envious. Sure that no foreigner would trade one of his scripts for a cassette player, he decided to become a painter instead. Then, in 1978, he picked up an old rung of a chair and started to sculpt it. He was nimble with his hands, and this moment changed his life. Long Live Chairman Mao, made in 1978, showed a screaming man holding Mao's little red book. It was a parody of his entire generation who shouted the phrases blindly. Wong Keping continued to sculpt, trying to find any scrap of wood he could. On seeing Wong's first sculpture, Bai Jing Zhou realized his considerable talent, encouraged Wong Keping because uh, Wong became a passionate about sculpting and soon a wide variety of political and dramatic wood sculptures took up, his, took up in his little home. Once Wong Keping made contact with Bai Jing Zhou's friend, Zhang Zhe, who taught foreign students calligraphy and painting at, at, the, at the university, he asked if he would help exchange one of his sculptures for a cassette player. Zhang Zhe was stunned when he visited Wong's home. Who gave you these? You can't fool me. These are national treasures. They could, not be, they could not be made to barter for a cassette player. That would be a great loss. In 1979, together with Huang Rei Madishong, two of our other artists at Ten Chancery Lane Gallery, Chu Lei Lei and some 20 other mostly self-taught artists, they formed a group called the Stars, Xing Xing, as a political statement of their time. They described themselves as light in the endless black. And all those stars look small, they are in fact huge like planets. The stars group of artists, frustrated by the lack of recognition or any prospect in a tightly controlled and regulated art environment, boldly hung their works on the gates of the National Museum of China on September 27, 1979 time to upstage the official propaganda exhibition, the national art exhibition for the 30th anniversary for the People's Republic of China. Here we see Wang Keping's work, Silence, hanging on the gates. Their manifesto is full of hope and makes me feel that it can still be a beacon to us today. Some highlights I would like to read. We 23 art explorers place some fruits of our labor here. The world leaves unlimited possibilities for explorers. The years come at us. There, is, there are no mysterious indications guiding our action. The shadow of the past and the glow of the future are folded together, forming the various living conditions of today. Resolving to live on and remembering each lesson learned, this is our responsibility. We love the ground beneath our feet. This ground nurtured us. We have no words to express the passion for it. Seizing the moment of the 30th anniversary of the nation's founding, we give our harvest back to the land and to the people. This brings us closer. We are full of confidence. 
when their works were taken down by the police, they hung this proclamation on the democracy wall, officially suing the police of the East Beijing branch. They marched through the streets and hundreds joined in, carrying a banner saying, uphold the constitution, we fight for artistic freedom. Here, artist Madashong gives a speech to an impassioned crowd during the Stars March. Wang Keping's works were the most daring of the group, targeting directly with bold political statements, something that had never been seen in Chinese art. Silence on the right. <laughs> um, Silence portrayed a mouth that had been corked, an eye that had been blinded, the head cut so no thinking, to signify the crippling force of the nation. Idol, a portrait of Chairman Mao as a Buddha figure, is perhaps the first artwork made that directly commented on Mao. This was to signify that the millions of people in China merely followed him um, without questioning his actions. Fist shows a giant hand crushing its people. Notice it is crushing a naked woman, a commentary on sexual repression. Chain showed a large hand over a mouth and a chain around the neck. This work has been donated to the M Plus Museum by Dr. Uli Sieg. Even nude female sculptures were in direct defiance of accepted themes in art. When the works were removed by the police, the artist staged a risky protest march demanding artistic freedom. The international press covered the exhibition. This was on the front page of the New York Times, Wang Keping holding silence and a painting by Huang Rei in the background. A year later, the star's artists were invited to exhibit inside the National Art Museum of China, and the rest is history with artists Wang Keping, Huang Rei, Madashang, Chu Lei Lei, and even a very young Ai Weiwei, all part of its making. Which was also covered in the Wall Street Journal with Wang Keping's idol and chain inclu uh, yeah, included in the piece. In 1984, Wong married a French woman, Catherine Desely, and moved to France. When Wong arrived in France, everything was new to him, and he had to adapt to the unrecognizably liberal climate. As it was not easy to work, he spent time going to the museums to learn about Western art as well as, as old and modern sculpture. Thoroughly briefed, he gained sufficient confidence to continue on his path. As a sculptor feeling quite correctly that there was no sculpture like his. Even during the early years of his career, he was sure that he had a unique voice and vision, and he was passionate about following it through. His works during this period are more coarse, and though less political, they continued to scream of frustration. However, in France, he started to feel that the scream exemplified the French art world. Wang Keping works in other materials. Here is a sculpture made from granite in Korea in the Olymp Olympic Sculpture Park in 1988, entitled Wings. Wang Keping admires the natural forms in wood and often leaves, it, leaves his sculptures with many aspects of the natural forms as, as part of the work. He speaks about each piece being a collaboration between himself and what the wood has to offer. In 1999, Keping participated in the Champs-Élysées, um, uh, the Champ de la Sculpture exhibition. These three works are more than three meters tall and made from single trunks of, of a tree. In 2005, he started to explore making works in bronze, works that he couldn't make in wood because of their size or actually thinness. 
woman leading is now showing here at Asia Society in Hong Kong is in, and is a shape that is not able to be made in wood. It's very fluid. Wang Keping begins his works when the wood is still wet and fresh and controls the cracking process as they dry out, putting them in different conditions or he might put a slash into the back to relieve the pressure so the work won't crack on the front. Wang, Wang Keping is so intimate with wood that the material is inseparable from his being. Such is his understanding of each block before him that he lets the wood guide him as he passes his hand over it. Emerging out of the knots and branches, a, a breast, a curl of the hair, an arm. He even uses the traces of worm tracks found under the bark to ornament the skirt of a woman in a vermicular lace. The flowing of the grain is well thought out in his work. They drip like waves to simulate hair on the back of the head or perfectly accent the curve of a woman's waist. He has said that to take the bark off of a piece of wood is like undressing a woman. Through his process, his passions are aroused. Thus, the cracks become an important aspect of his works, as you can see here an example of large cracks in the wood that become part of the final piece. This aspect of collaboration with nature and the artist is very important to Wang Keping. As is the grain to add flowing and the knots, branches and protrusions. We can see how the grain creates a fluid gentleness to his works. The large work, this large work was made live um, as a project with the Chernusi Museum. Sorry. His tools are many. He uses chainsaws as well. He is now 70 years old, but he still refuses to have an assistant, claiming, as he says, that it is like making love. You cannot have someone do it for you. In his monograph, he has included a poem he has written. This is really a definition of his vision in, this, in his work. In this work, you see exactly what that poem says. The rounds and squares, the verticals and the balance. I'll read it for you. Four sides, three ovals, two verticals, one horizontal. Within the round, a square. Within the square, a round. Straight lines, curved lines, plan, protrusions, softness, hardness, matte, gloss, wood and flesh, nature and intent, material and ethereal, depiction and suggestion, prudence and desire, reservation and tenderness, vigor of youth and rings of old wood, a slash from the edge, a head emerges, between presence and absence, not an eye, not a mouth, the smile of Mona Lisa, isn't it? The black of Africa, the voice of Han, primitive, modern, oriental and occidental, neither Chinese nor French, yet, without arrangement, concepts fuse with its own vocabulary, the wood speaks. Wang Keping speaks of those rounds and squares and says that they actually are ancient and go back to primitive times, such as this Chinese coin. And we can feel that in this series of work from, called Eternal Smile, a series of iron boxes that Wang Keping made. Um, it's an erotic symbol and a universal form. How his idea um, of purest form evolved, it, it goes back since his early days. These lips go back to the 80s. And I show them to actually emphasize his ability to focus on simplicity. If any sculptor today so deftly explores eroticism, it is Wang Keping. 
He has the ability to carve shapes into sensual beings, buxom women, or curvaceous, or couples in embrace, beings where the wood becomes alive in a seductive poem, or move, or in dance. Here the woman flies, as in modern butterfly. This work is one meter in diameter, made from a massive slice of trunk. She becomes light in dance. Like a geisha in a kimono, she flirts with her audience. He speaks of Zen in Buddhism, but not in a religious way, rather as a philosophy of being, material versus non-material, the physical versus the spiritual, flesh versus nothingness, the yin and the yang. Couples melt together in a simple pairing of that yin and yang. He speaks often about his mother and the yearning he has for her. Mother and child meld into one in many of his sculptures. Here we have a beautiful work of a mother embracing her child. The geometric forms of ovals and rectangles as well as circles and squares find balance through figurative abstraction. Such forms, he states, have been found since primitive times and he, in, and he reinterprets them today. Desire, the giant lips parted with a tongue coming out, is both audacious and comical. And this is that part of Wang Keping that is laden with his very wry sense of humor. The theatrical jokes come to life in many of his works. Here he laughs in defiance and mischief. And we see his sense of humor in the man. He's playing, goofing around in his studio, sitting atop his bird sculpture. Wang Keping's words, works are, are diverse. However, his message remains the same. He opposes conceptual definitions of art and continues to be a dissident artist, as he says. When I came to France, my opponent changed. I fight the trend in today's art. His search and evolution continue in a quiet manner, and he is no, in no rush. He feels it is society that needs to change and that his determined process is part of that. Looking at the flow of the grain of wood on his works as they define the curve of a waist or, or how a knot of the wood cleverly shapes a nipple on a woman's breast. Wang Keping's purest pursuit as a sculptor is unveiled through nature and simplicity. I'd like to thank um, everyone for this live stream here today of Wang Keping and to bring your attention that uh, you can see the artist speaking about his work on the 10 Chancery Lane Gallery YouTube channel, uh, just search up Wonka Ping, or also on artpowerhk.com. And I'd like to also thank the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association and Asia Society, as well as Art Power HK. Thank you so much. So first of all, I want to thank Aura Aura, um, Henry Odili, and uh, of course the Asia Society and the um, Arts Gallery Associations for this very privileged event to introduce two young up and coming rising stars. <laughs> um, today we have Rose here and Janet there. And um, I can also feel as in a little bit of the background. So um, Aura Aura, Henry was asking me, oh, what, what about um, hosting a talk? Um, and, and this is also a very uh, important time. Uh, many things have been through in this city. And initially, uh, we, we, we were kind of brainstorming, maybe we, um, um, Henry might do uh, the moderations and uh, but then in the end, we thought maybe it's it's more important to give this privileged time to um, to to you guys, 
to tell us a little bit more about what's the situation, what's the difficulties or the opportunities that's ahead of us. So we, 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 we really want to be listeners for the next 30 minutes and um, to hear what you may want to say to us. And uh, the title of this talk is Hong Kong Arts, um, the new generation, the next generation. So uh, this is more or less um, the, 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 the framework of today's talk. And uh, some of you may ask, like, why among all the talents, why do we pick Rose and Janet here? So a little bit of introduction. J Janet uh, currently is in her final year uh, in HKBU AVA, the Academy of Visual Arts, and she is the president of the graduation show. So she is aspiring to be um, more in art administrations and curatorial practice, and she is at the moment handling over 100 um, young artists' works uh, to put together this show. Hopefully it's not going to be virtual. <laughs> hopefully this will be something that we can all experience, and hopefully uh, some of you in Hong Kong may be able to come. And uh, and then we have also Rose here. Uh, Rose is in our PhD program at the uh, also the Academy of Visual Arts, and uh, she is a practicing artist um, and graduated from CUHK Fine Arts. So we will learn more about her practice um, shortly. So um, maybe to 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 start, I wanted maybe Janet to start talking about this image here. So every year, um, the graduation show team committee would try to think of an image or a kind of a, 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 an identity uh, as a way to kind of um, condense or distill um, um, the, the atmosphere of, of all the graduates. So I believe this is the image that you guys are working on. So maybe you can tell us from from uh, from your committee what's this all about. Yeah, well, I, um, actually, this image is still a raw image. It is not finished. And a disclaimer: I did not take the photos. My team did. And actually, I think Hope made. Um, I mean, Rose may feel the same way. Is that it is kind of an image to talk about we are losing imagination, we are losing hope because of the very sensitive situation right now in Hong Kong and also in around the world. So we kind of want to express um, our struggles, like what are we going to do without the protection of the school? What do we do after we break out of this barrier? So, But at the same time, we want to be more ambiguous because we don't want it to be too sen uh, sensitive or to be too political. We kind of have like a self censorship to this um, concept because, like, uh, in one on one hand, because at the end of the day we still have to ask for sponsorship for our graduation show. On the other hand. Because this show is for the public as well, as well as for the all of the 100 graduates. So we want to remain kind of neutral for everyone to interpret um, their own meanings in this image. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And this is the image for Rose year. So Rose graduated from CUHK 2017. And you would you like to also share something about this image? Sure. So um, I graduated from Chinese University, the Department of Fine Arts in 2017. And then the theme of our ex exhibition was nothing's gonna change my love for you. So it is actually questioning what is contemporary art? And also, is there something that is eternal? Is there something that is forever there and I think it actually relates to our age now because even 2020 now three years later I still feel like I have a lot of questions about contemporary art as a practicing artist and also I think in terms of the political situation as well as the coronavirus now we are feeling a kind of hopeless 
and also we could not really imagine the future ahead of us. So I think it actually relates to the time now as well. So it sounds quite pessimistic <laughs> from from these uh, these interpretations, but you also mentioned maybe from your experience now, Rose, you have graduated from the your bachelor degree a number of years ago. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit of your journey. So you you are now more established, and uh, and and what made you to 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 make up your mind to to pursue this long career uh, in arts, and also you're now doing a PhD. PhD. I think during my bachelor years, actually a lot of confusion and also support from my um, colleagues and also artists, friends as well. But I think during the journey and also the process, there are a lot of questions about art itself as well as the relation between art and society as well that I was thinking about. And I think the reason why I want to pursue a PhD afterwards is that I think research is also important in terms of a practicing artist because it provides you the ground with the so uh, social conditions as well as the political so uh, conditions of making art. And I think that is also important in terms of how you understand your age in practicing your art. And so you mentioned about this notions of arts and society and arts maybe having um, a role in the society, right? Maybe can you elaborate a little bit about this? And, and, and so you feel very pessimistic, but at the same time, you've, you are hopeful that art has a role in, in our society, right? I would say that I'm still very hopeful and I believe in the power of art in changing society. But I think the effect of art in terms of changing society is not immediate kind of effect. It is more embedded in the traditions and also in how we perceive our society from time to time, from generations to generations. Because I think there are questions that every generation faces. For example, like Jeanette mentioned, um, without the protection of the school, the university, the academy, what are we? And what do we do to, in terms of pursuing a career in Hong Kong as an artist? I think these are some of the questions that everybody faces when graduation is a point as like right in front of us. Do you have something to share, Janet? Well, I do think, like, as Rose has mentioned, um, art is very, they can change the society in the long term. But to me, it is also about recording the society. Like, I think when artists do create an artwork, they are recording, like, um, the presence in a very alternative uh, perspective. So... When the times come, when the artwork do become like history, then people can understand the history with um, an emotion, with an experience input, instead of just reading it from words without any other personal feelings in there. So I think it is very useful in creating like or capturing what I call maybe potential or alternative history. Yeah, I think there is an artist like. Uh, a sound artist called Felix Blumen. He do work a lot with soundscapes that record what is going on around him in the society. I think his works are quite interesting. So, like, I do draw some inspiration from him as well. Yeah. And Rose, would, w do you have some um, maybe artists that you really appreciate uh, working yeah, in this I regard? Think um, just thinking about how art can change society, I think of the work by Le Natalie Lo, Lo Lai Lai. And she's a Hong Kong artist, and then she tried to um, think of the alternative of living through artistic practice, and she started agriculture and growing her own vegetations and food products. And I think it's a very interesting kind of artistic practice because it's not only about making an exhibition or some kind of publication is about the whole artistic practice and its relation with life. Yeah, absolutely. And um, speaking of that, I'm also going to some of their farms tomorrow to start planting rice. <laughs> it's about time. And so on one hand, we can go to park and shop and 
chase for the last uh, bags of rice. Um, maybe we can also, like you said, uh, in Lo Lai Lai and many of the artists in Hong Kong is also working very much about uh, how do we, we think about consumptions and uh, the local productions and, and way of living. And, and absolutely, there's much that we can learn from that. Okay, well, maybe um, on the note of inspirations, um, maybe it's also interesting from, I, I think maybe some of the audience um, of Asia society, they may not be from Hong Kong. So maybe they are also interested, well, what, what is the edge or maybe what, what young artists in Hong Kong uh, maybe differ than in, in other regions or places? Um, and maybe to look into this, can we kind of maybe look at your inspirations? Like what, what sparks you in your creations and what's your interest? And maybe we can distill a little bit of insights. Uh, how are Hong Kong artists identified um, ourselves and uh, what, what are the potentials in the future? Right? So um, this is an image from Rose. <laughs> Would you maybe tell us a little bit about your inspiration and your work? So I'm actually, um, besides a practicing artist, I also practice yukke, or if you like Cantonese opera, and I'm a performer. So I've been training and also uh, performing through a decade ago. So I think it's very exciting in terms of how I see tradition and contemporary in a parallel line, and how I try to incorporate my experiences in Cantonese opera performances and practice in my artistic practice. So actually my doctoral degree is, my thesis is about tools and aesthetics and recontextualizing UK in Hong Kong. So it will be about um, how we see the aesthetics of UK in terms of Sichu, as a genre of Sichu, and also how uh, there are common similarities and also differences in the region of Guangdong in terms of different genres. Particularly, it is about like, it is toward aesthetic and not as about aesthetic. Yes, I think aesthetics will be a very large project to, in terms of scope, to conduct in the four-year doctoral degree. So I'm thinking the next scholarly project might be about the aesthetics of UK. But I think for now it's more about how I see the different experiences in terms of a practicing artist and also a performer of UK. And we have also one more image. This is from your CUHK show. And this was also in a few other shows, right? In uh, the Chutlo, uh, was it? Uh, did you have other opportunities to show this work? Actually, this is the only time that I showed his work okay. in the graduation show. Um, and this is actually a backstage of a UK performance. And then I reconstructed the backstage in a corner in the Art Museum of Chinese University. And the idea behind this is that it's not only a prop or a setup, I also perform in it. So my performance was about removing and also putting on makeup consecutively for seven hours a day in the opening and closing ceremony and a few days of the exhibition. And I think the act of repeating is actually interesting in terms of how it inspired the kind of, um, in terms of practice, you have to repeat a gesture many, many times to master it. And I think it loses its meaning in the way. So I'm sort of questioning what is the practice of UCAT at that time? You also had a work in 1A space, right? Can you maybe tell, we don't have an image here, but maybe you can ex expand a little bit. Yeah. So the work in 1A space is actually part of a literature crossover visual art exhibition. And it was based on a poem by Shishi. And then at that time, um, it was exhibited in 1A space last February or March. And um, actually I created a video, a three minutes video of repeated falling of women. And then it was a question which also relates to Shishi's poem about the fate of women in the portrayal in UK. Okay, great. And now I'll move to Janet. <laughs> now, this is the work that you wanted to talk a little bit about, right? Yeah, because instead of very uh, cultural, well, this is also cultural context, but I do draw a lot of inspiration from daily life. So this work is actually a collab, uh, collab work with two of my friends because we were in Germany, in Beijing and in Hong Kong, I think the last summer, coincidentally with different reasons. So 
But at the same time, we do encounter difficulties in different places because of language, because we don't understand what people are talking about. So I do think like language, I never realized like language is, is so important to a person's sense of belonging. So this is why we created this work and why we deliberately uh, choose not to put any captions on it because unless you speak all four languages because it was created with Mandarin, uh, Cantonese, English and German. So this this is part of the text. Yeah, Maybe it's part too, of the text. Too small for, for the screen, but um, um, so you intend to have four languages yeah, and so it's, unless it's spoken you speak, in the work? Yeah, yeah, it's spoken in four languages. So unless you speak all four languages, you would not understand the whole pictures of what we were experiencing or what exactly were we talking about. So it's, it's kind of like putting our experience to the audience as well, like making them feel that way as well. Yeah. And this is about sense of belonging, this work. You're yeah, I do think this is about sense of belonging and also very personal experience um, on cultural differences and cultural shock as well. I think this sense, this notion of sense of belonging is also quite, um, well, well, eminent in Hong Kong. Um, it is very complex, right? The compositions and the histories and and the state of mind. Um, and maybe could you to elaborate a little bit about this sense of belonging in Hong Kong? And, and Rose, you you said you you have new feelings about Hong Kong over what um, Hong Kong have been through over the past. Uh, months, right? So I was born and raised in Hong Kong and everything that I experienced, my families, my friends are all in Hong Kong and I'm thinking that I don't have this sense of belonging since I was young to this place called Hong Kong and I'm thinking why is that? Is that because of education? Is that because of my perception towards sense of belonging? Is there something wrong with me? And then when I grew up and then I experienced the recent social chaos. And I think that the sense of belonging is quite a tricky term in terms of how they um, organize us as a group of young people. And also in terms of how they call this solidarity. And I'm still not in a very good position to answering this question, I think, because I think to me it's still a very complex issue in terms of sense of belonging. But I feel like I still wanna stay in this place um, I don't think it's a very good kind of solution to just go away if this place is not like before. Yeah. So we start off saying, well, it, it seems quite um, quite a, a lot of despair and, and you cannot see much hope, but in, in the end, you, you do ha you, you're still hopeful, right? You, 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 uh, you feel like you, you can identify with the city even more with, with the, um, the recent incidents. I think in times of chaos, actually, it sparks creativity. And then we see different artists using different kind of strategies to cope with their um, cycle and also mental status. And I think that is also interesting. So it is interesting, actually, now to stay in Hong Kong and see what happens and how to deal with it on both a personal and also a collective level. Great. Janet? Well, I... I'm a person that doesn't have a very strong sense of belonging towards a place. My sense of belonging mainly comes from my families, actually. So I kind of have a feeling like when wherever my families go, then that place is my home. So like I'm not the kind of person that will have like a very strong identity crisis because I moved to somewhere as long as I can adapt in that place and I can learn their languages. So like I said, I think languages is one of the main things that you can integrate yourself into the community, into the society. It's less about what color, because like at the end of the day, every person is the same, to be honest. Like, I don't believe like, <laughs> like I'm not racist. So I think you can, integrate yourself into wherever you want as long as you work for it. So um, to me, 
if I choose to move out of Hong Kong or stay in Hong Kong, it would mainly be because if I can see opportunities or if I can see a future here. Yeah. Good. I seen there was a sign for us to wrap up. Uh, so, is there any final words that you you may want to share? I think following up the question because it's complex, but it's also inspiring to think about it. I think there is a border knife for me to stay in Hong Kong or not. Is about the freedom of artistic expression, and once that is lost, I think I will need to move. But that is a necessity. So I think um, I hope that in Hong Kong still, we have the freedom of artistic expression as well as freedom of speech and to truly to live as a human being. That's that. And Janet? Well, all I can say is we all hope for the best for the freedom of artistic practice. And I think also is if a place can still offer you inspirations, I do think that is quite important because if you lose all imagination toward a place, then you wouldn't be able to create a very strong and very um, movable work anymore. So let's just hope everyone still maintain that kind of passions and the place can still offer us this interest. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you to Rose you, thanks, and man. Jeanette. Thanks. And uh, we can open up the... the uh, yeah, to the floors or <laughs> any online comments or questions, if there's any. If not, then, um, well, have a good afternoon, everyone, and stay healthy. We are very happy to have such an opportunity to discuss uh, the relationship between art, politics, and society, and uh, to do so wearing a mask, which is, of course, uh, uh, something that brings us back to the antique theater of Greece, wearing a persona. And uh, maybe the best way in those times of crisis to tell the truth. And uh, it's important talking about art, uh, I believe to remind the fact that maybe art has not the fair place in our society. Art uh, is struggling to tell us some strong messages, to find new questions and maybe giving a strong importance to question much more than answer which is a way to make us think what is our society, what is the future of our society, how should we organize our society, what is the goal of politics, and through questioning and through a certain freedom of thinking, art is able to go beyond borders, beyond habits that we have, and to invent a new type of relationship. In that sense, art is bringing new ideas, new possibilities to all of us. And uh, in a world which is tempted by isolation, tempted by nationalism, much more than ever, art is needed to bring new horizons. But at the same time, we should not be naive. Art is a place for confrontation, is a place for competition, because most of our countries understand that soft power is something very important. If you remember, at the end of the Second World War, Europe was still dominating the art world, and then the US, because the strong economy that they had because the importance in today's world, they gained the more influence and they are still dominating the art market today. And then of course, we are now in a new situation with the rivalry between China and the US. And the question is, how is our world going to be organized? What are going to be the main influences in our world? And I believe that we should try to hear as many voices as possible. And art 
has to give the possibility for even small culture, small countries to make their voice to be here because diversity is one very key rule of art. And that's why I believe we should really uh, be concerned by some of the important experiences we have in the world of art. For example, the, the initiative that had been taken by a country like France here in Hong Kong. And I think the, 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 the experience in that case of the French May is something that we can take many lessons out of this experience. And Julien, you might be the best one today uh, to, to tell us more about it. So uh, indeed, what's interesting is that uh, when the Frenchman started 28 years ago now, in 1993, uh, the idea was part of uh, the soft power of France, which, as you say, was something that um, the French government took uh, for a long, long time. Um, but what's interesting is that when it started as a one-week festival back in the days, mainly gathering the local initiatives, uh, it has now become a major festival for Hong Kong uh, with around 120 events uh, from performances to uh, visual arts. And what we saw very interesting is that through um, the history and the evolution, uh, we really uh, managed to take a role to uh, the Hong Kong cultural scene, not just, of course, to bringing what we think is, uh, you know, the essence of French culture and what can benefit to Hong Kong, but also um, to be um, a dialogue, actually, between uh, the Hong Kong local scene and the audience. And I think that's what uh, made the festival very uh, successful as well as interesting for us is that when we program the idea is in line with what you mentioned is an idea of diversity uh, showing what we think is um, representative of what the French culture has to offer as the best but also what uh, can make an impact in Hong Kong uh, for example all along the year we can see that some fields of the arts are not so much represented um, I would quote um, Baroque music for example or um, some uh, theater performances. Um, so when we pick our programs, we also try to see how bringing these French examples, those French artists can actually inspire uh, the audience here with some art forms that they don't know, and that can uh, help um, them to discover something new. Um, and it goes back to, I think, the, the real dialogue between the cultures that you mentioned, where um, when we bring our artists, we always try to have some sharing moments, mm -hmm. some master classes or workshops on top of the performances, um, to have this moment of exchange between the artists and the audience, or the artist and the local scene, to see how um, each other can benefit of that. Um, and what we found the most interesting is that um, our artists kind of make an impact here to the local scenes. We have a lot of um, then audience or artists that come to us and say, okay, I really discovered a new art form. I would like to know more. But reciprocally, many French artists coming here suddenly discover Asian culture, um, Chinese culture, and then would also incorporate that into our experience. Um, and for example, um, in the past years, uh, Murad Merzouki, the uh, contemporary dancer, um, was so impressed by some techniques and artists in Taiwan that he really came back to create um, his new show inspired by some tales from uh, Taiwan and also by the techniques that he learned from artists. And I think that's where um, we really succeed in the festival is to create those kind of dialogues. Uh, what's yeah, uh, what's uh, very interesting in, in, in the case of the French May, it is a public initiative. But of course, art is something that we should be all concerned with. So it can be public, but it can also be private. It is a, a common good. And of course, it's interesting in, 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 to hear some uh, more private initiatives. I think uh, many institutions have a role to play, galleries, of course, museums, uh, associations, uh, NGOs. So it might be interesting, Arthur, to, to hear your own experience in times of crisis. What do you think is the role of art and how should we be part um, in the private sector? 
uh, such questions. I was about to say, and I think it's, it's, it's really interesting, the, the place that Hong Kong altogether has given to such a foreign initiative. When you think about it, where could you see that around the world? Uh, the French May is one of the major cultural events in Hong Kong of the year. And the fact that Hong Kong let that happen, I found it fantastic. And it's true that we ask me many times, why do you open a gallery in Hong Kong? You know, Hong Kong is going through some tough times. Now it is the crisis, before it was the coronavirus. And, 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 and for me, it was very obvious. And, and I think it's, it's part of the reason why the, the, this place, the welcome of Hong Kong, this dynamic, this first for creativity and this platform that you can create uh, to bring new initiatives and to bring culture, I found it always amazing. And, and, uh, and this is for that reason that I decided then to, to think Hong Kong would be the best platform to eco around Asia Pacific and to bet on the, on the potential of the Asian region, which, uh, which I think is very important for the next 10, 20 years to come because this is where uh, 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 there will be a major shift into the art market. Uh, more than that, the, the other question that we ask me many times, why, why opening now during this crisis, uh, while you could wait a little bit more, why you could open next year? Uh, and, and this made me think about what was the, 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 the uh, um, reason, the, the real uh, uh, understanding of why art is important. And it's true that when you have Art Basel cancelling, when you have all this, this, this wave of, 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 of the art world, the art market that is so strong, suddenly slowing down, uh, it's very hard to think about uh, uh, bringing another kind of music into the, into this, into the system. So the idea of saying that um, a gallery uh, can be here for just education. The idea that art is here to ask some questions, uh, is here to bring a new vision of the world and, and to bring us something more than just entertainment and something beautiful to look at. I think that this was important in our mission because this is the way I live art and this is the way I think art in general is a, a requirement for societies, but artists all have a mission in the way they build a life, and I think this is the case of Zaoki. That's a, an interesting point because uh, um, the times we are going through, which are times of crisis, um, show us the importance of questioning what is the mission of the artist in our societies. And, and uh, this mission, I think we should, we should try to clarify it. And I believe uh, through my experience, that there are at least three important missions. The first one is the universal mission of the artist. If we take artists like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Rembrandt, uh, ancient uh, uh, artists uh, uh, of China or, or, or around the world, they are expressing universal values. And anybody around the world can understand those artists, uh, writers like Dante, Shakespeare, Moliere, they, of course, talk to any one of us, whatever is the region of the world uh, from which we belong. But there is, of course, in the art market, a second role which has been dominant uh, in the last year and dominating the art market, which is iconic artists. If we look like uh, to, to people like uh, Jeff Koons, uh, Murakami, um, Damien Hirst, these artists are completely dominating the art market. They are the most expensive artists uh, around the world. And I will say that their main characteristic is to be a reflection of what is the world. We are in a world of consumption, so they express the reality, the excess. They are a mirror of the society. But there is a third role given to the artist, I believe, which is to be bridges. And Artists that are bridges, and I believe uh, the, 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 the Chinese artist, Franco-Chinese artist, Zhao Qi is in this category. Picasso is in this category. They have many roots in different cultures, different regions, and they can build bridges between regions. And I think that's also an important role for any art initiative. And maybe uh, you could, uh, Julien, tell us a little more about those initiatives that can bring 
a better understanding between people. That's for sure. I mean, going back to our programming and the way we choose our program every year. Um, a few years ago, in 2014 in particular, we were celebrating uh, the friendship uh, you know, between France and China. And then when we built our program, I wanted to show to our friends in Hong Kong that indeed we're not just bringing French art to show how important it is, how it has inspired or it can inspire, but also to show uh, the other part, how France and French artists nourish themselves from other cultures, and in particularly Chinese cultures. And so we had a very interesting exhibition at the Hong Kong Museum of Art, which was called Paris Chinese Painters, which indeed um, uh, featured uh, great artists like Zhao Qi, but also earlier in the beginning of the 20th century, how a lot of artists went to France got inspired by what they saw in France, Picasso and the others, and how they also made their mark to those artists in bringing them some new culture um, in the way that before that, you know, uh, a primitive art or Japanese art had inspired the artist. And um, we also, um, I wanted to also um, show them how some of the pride of France, such as um, the manufacture of Sèvres, you know, the very famous uh, manufactured porcelain, was actually built by uh, Louis XV to um, try to recreate the absolutely uh, fantastic porcelain from China that we had to import because the French were not yet able to know the secrets of the, of the porcelain. And because the kings and uh, the court were so fascinated by that that they tried to um, discover the secret and then enhance it up to becoming actually also masters in their own fields in a different aspect. So um, I thought it was important to show that actually what we think that is really the essence sometimes of our um, culture and craftsmanship is back in some of dialogue and inspiration and that throughout history we have to gain from those bridges and not being you know, in, in a competition all the time as you said uh, but more to cooperate, collaborate and learn from each other. I, I think this is this is really key, and I, I, I loved it because you even talked about uh, primitive art and uh, uh, this concept of reconciliation that we brought into our show uh, with, with Zaoki, and this idea that you can get influenced by others, but it doesn't mean that you will change your identity. It will mean you will enrich your own identity, and you will ha you will enable your own self to be. Uh, uh, to, to grow, and I think that this is such an interesting concept in a world where we 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 we, believe, we live individualism, and we have some kind of the feeling that artists represent a bit too much themselves. The uh, idea that when you admire, you don't change uh, uh, yourself, but you actually grow, uh, uh, and this is the case, of course, of uh, earlier early artists like Picasso, like Modigliani that took on the primitive art uh, from Africa, but it's also for sure the case of Zaoki that all his life admired other artists. And these artists enabled uh, uh, him to be more himself. And this, I found, I found it fantastic. Most of the people folk, uh, uh, know uh, most of the time the, the, the European influence uh, and the artists like Paul Klee, like Paul Cézanne, uh, like Matisse, in, into uh, 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 Zaoki, but you have to know that is he also did a, a wonderful reconciliation with America and with the U.S. because he li he went in 1957 uh, in the U.S. did a big trip with Pierre Soulages, and he really uh, absorbed the American uh, uh, um, ab ex uh, abstract ex expressionism at that time and really make it his own to create a new kind of art and to reconcile also this part of the world. So not only he was reconciling uh, East with Asia and China, his roots and, and, and West through Europe, but also, uh, also the US. And, and I think that, that, that we can see it in different paintings uh, and uh, uh, the, the ones from the 60s with homage to Kennedy that are very important in the way that he is uh, reconciling also this tradition. I think it's, a, it's an important message uh, to send today because we see that nationalism has a growing importance in trade, in politics, in technology. And uh, art and culture, on the contrary, they make us understand that we have something very special in common. We are part of the same humanity. And this is something that we should not forget. Everyone, because of fear, uh, is... Uh, 
inclined to forget this common humanity, but art, um, getting to know better the other through um, art and culture, this help us to go beyond our fears. This help us to fight against our fear and to discover that in front of us, there is not an enemy, but there is somebody who is like us with the same kind of questioning, the same kind of preoccupation. And I believe that is really the role of art in times of crisis. And I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier with universalism, which for me, uh, globalism means that instead of you know leveling everything to the same um, to the same level and, and absorbing things should instead be enhancing and accumulating more of the resources, more of the experiences that we have through the different cultures to make a global culture richer, more universal and not just flat and, and you know... Um that gives even more importance to rooted artists and to rooted culture. Uh, it must not be uh, an activity, art and culture, dominated by the market but really deeply rooted in our countries, in our own experience, and that makes the price of art. So maybe we could imagine that after this uh, dramatic crisis, the, 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 the art scene and the culture scene might have to undergo a, an important change, which is really to, to think and to look at the real mission of art. What is art about? Art is not just the stock market. It's not just making money. Art is helping us to change our lives, helping us to go through different and, and difficult moments in life. And I think it goes back to the responsibility also then, of course, of uh, uh, the art actors, whether it's the institutions, the museum, the galleries, in the way they curate the show, in the way they build story around the, the, the exhibitions, but also about the collectors. And I think that here, the collectors have a real responsibility, and that draws back on the uh, history of collectors that have changed artists, that in sometimes have protected artists and protected their, their art. And, and, and collectors that feel that they are more than just buying to make money or speculate on some paintings, but collectors that are here because they have a certain vision of their art. Whether, they, whether it is the right one or not, they have their own vision, their own view of, of looking at the world, not collecting the best pieces from all the, the famous periods, but collecting a, a, a way that they want to, to uh, uh, raise questions about the world that they're living in. And I think that these collectors today in Asia more than ever have a responsibility a responsibility to show the road of saying who we want to be, how we want to build our society. And here, all together, no one is going to be political because I don't think that the artist is political, neither the collector. But I think that when sometimes politics cannot answer some questions and, and politics uh, doesn't have any meaning in moments like these when people feel lost and that politics has almost abandoned them, I think that these answers can be found in art, through artists, and through the art world. I really do agree, and I believe that art and culture um, are bringing us, in those difficult moments, two very important lessons. The first one is memory. They help us to understand that throughout very different times in history, art has been able to find new way of breathing, new way of living, new way of inventing and facing the difficulties of our times. The second uh, lesson, I believe, is conscience. Uh, art and culture are always showing us the way and giving us the lesson that we should question ourselves. We should find the freedom in ourselves to, to put forward the good questions not just accept anything, but try to always do better, find new ways to, to, to get closer to one another and, and understand better what is uh, the thinking or the behavior of others. So this is, I believe, something that helps us to look forward. We are going to go through difficult moments. How much are we going to be changed by the crisis we have been going through? How much are we going to be able to, 
to take the burden of really changing our societies to get more adapted to the realities of our world. More equality, more fairness, a better ability to live in our planet. I believe art and culture are key to make us take the good decisions. And um, also I think definitely what we all um, look forward after those difficult times is that arts bring us together as well. And um, I think it's really important that it, it builds this idea of a community, of an exchange, uh, whether, as you as you say, it's the, the questions that are received and exchanged or what the artists want to put forward. And I think this is really something that helps us also go through all those difficult times, all those moments, is to you know build people together. Arthur, you have the last word. Well, uh, no, I mean, art is uh, art is everything, and I think art, if we are looking for some questions, art is the answer. Thank you so much. <laughs>